So, well, let's just get on with it. So the first speaker is Lisa Schatz. Sorry, just before we get started, I'd like to remind all speakers, we've got five minutes, and also, please uh, speak into the microphone so that everyone at the back can hear. of the way things tend to unfurl in this world. Okay, you can tell me which one you think sounds better. So on the, the first side we have, the first question the team asks is, what data do we have? That's team A. You can vote on which one you prefer at the end. Team B says, what decision needs to change? All right, go back to team A. The next question they ask is, how are we going to combine all the data that we have and add big data to it? Team B says, what insight would drive a better decision? See where I'm going with this? Next one. We need to employ a team to use the data. How do we structure them? You heard that one? Someone has. And what, <laughs> team B, I don't know why I've called the best team B, but you know, you know where I'm going. What business processes need to change to enable that? What structural people process and other adjustments are needed to ingest this insight into the point of the decision? All right, next, go back to team A. What tools do we have to analyse the data? Why not I cut to the chase? What can we do with all this data? Who in the business will be interested in it? How would the business like to use the data? What reports would they like to see? What value would using the data bring to them? That's a really interesting place to land. And on the other side we have, what analytics would be used to create the insight? What data would be needed to fuel that insight? What tools might we use to get that insight? And what infrastructure? Oh gosh, we've got to it at the end. What infrastructure would support that? Software, hardware, people. So who thinks that vote team A, I'm gonna ask you to vote, who like the data-driven team, team A? What data? Who like the decision-driven team, B? Well, I think, the, I think team B won here. Okay, so I've got 34 seconds and I want you to reflect on this because we don't have time for it. Why is it that you, the data scientists, think that the decision matters and yet everyone you deal with thinks that the data matters? Oh, it's a 
a challenge. I don't actually really have an answer. That's kind of why I started writing the book. But I think the point is this group, everyone so far has talked about, you start with the goal and you work back, right? So I think the New Year's resolution, if I, was, if I had a plea for this group, it would be go out and educate everyone else and make sure they tell you what the goal is. And I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Um, sometimes we make decisions with no data. I just think that out there. Like getting married. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next speaker is Andrew Robinson from Melbourne Uni. I'm not using this. I'm going to ask you a question that I'm going to pretend is rhetorical. I'll pretend it's rhetorical only because I don't have time for it to be anything other than rhetorical. So, what would you do if you had $20 billion just to spend on something, something you wanted? What would you do? Well, I, what I would do is I would give drinkable water to every person in the world. Or with about a billion dollars you could restore sight to half the people in the world who are blind. And with about a hundred billion dollars, now I'm getting fancy, you could wipe out malaria entirely. So these to me sound like good goals to have. If we had that kind of money to spend. That kind of money is spent all the time, every year, in biosecurity failures. The United States government, for example, the, the, the loss, the, the net loss to the United States economy for all invasives is $120 billion. Net loss. The net loss globally for invasives is, I think, around $5 trillion, estimated at around 5% of global GDP. Invasive species cost us a hell of a lot of money. In fact, they're rated second only to climate change, which of course, as we know, is bullshit, thanks to our Prime Minister. Second only to bullshit. Invasion species are second only to bullshit in terms of the, the threat that they represent to global ecosystems and economies. Protecting the country from biosecurity for biosecurity purposes is what is the remit of the Department of Agriculture. The Department of Agriculture has teamed with the Center of Excellence for Biosecurity Risk Analysis, of which I'm uh, a, a, a part. And our goal is to, to develop new tools to help protect the country more efficiently. Now, it turns out that actually the department does a heck of a lot of work protecting the country. So our goal sometimes isn't so much to figure out what it can do more of, but what it can do less of. The department spends, say, half a billion dollars a year of everybody's money on biosecurity interventions. But, but put that up against the cost of failure. For example, the, the, uh, the, uh, the economists in the Department of Agriculture estimate that if there were just a teeny-weeny outbreak of foot and mouth disease, teeny-weeny, I might add, like a single sneeze, it would cost the economy $16 billion. Just like that. So that's a really important uh, pest to keep out. So, what does the Department of Agriculture handle? Well, last year there were 31 million air cargo consignments, 3 million sea cargo consignments, 19 million air passengers, 17,000 international vessel arrivals, and 187 million international mail articles crossing the border. Where is the risk? How do we figure out where the department should intervene best in this panoply of opportunity for pests to invade? I'm going to go over five minutes, by the way. Just so I can hear the sound. <laughs> That's my only purpose. <laughs> of course you can. You can have the microphone to amplify the sound. Otherwise, there's nowhere to be heard over me. <laughs> so, I'm a statistician. I'm a flyer statistician. I'm a Galileo supplier statistician. I'm thinking, I've got tools. I'll bring my tools and solve the problem. I could use decision trees or, or linear models. I could do shrinkage. I could do boosted regression trees. Or I could bring out the big guns and do support vector machines. Or buy gum, random forests. <laughs> or I could do cross-validation. And I could use, oh, of course, if I did that, I would use not AIC or, or P. I would use metrics that mean something because decisions are made using metrics. We have to interpret the metrics in order to make the decisions. And, of course, we would carefully allow for the fact that the future might be slightly different than the past because we're professionals. I've got a minute. I'm going to go over and sit down. That's the shiny solution. The, you know, the, 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 the good solution, though, of course, you, the, the, the lovely thing about these data mining exercises is how they look on paper. 
But if you try to implement them, that's an entirely different problem. I see you recognizing nods in the audience. So what did we do instead? We came up with an idea that had been invented 60 years before, called CSP by a wonderful mathematician called Dodge, generated in the, in, in the manufacturing industry. Here's the algorithm. Every pathway, every set of activities is in one of two modes, enhanced mode or monitoring mode. You start in enhanced mode. In enhanced mode, you inspect all the items, and you switch to monitoring mode after C consecutive passes. So intuitive. If you're in the monitoring mode, you inspect every percent of these items, randomly selected, and you switch back to enhanced mode upon any fail. You start in enhanced mode. This is data mining light. It naturally focuses inspection resources where those inspection resources are deemed to be needed the most. <laughs> is that the best you can do? Yes. There's an equivalent down there. And I'm now, now having, having heard the alarm. I will yield the floor. <laughs> Thank you for that lively presentation. Uh, we're going to move, move uh, into the uh, banking area with Tony Wallace from NAB. Uh, I'll have a go at using this, and if I fail, I'll put it down and wave my arms madly. Um, I'd like to thank Phil and Yuval and Damien for allowing me to speak about um, speak now. Oh, predictive models in marketing financial products for a whole five minutes. Um, I hope that doesn't put you to sleep, but I'm a predictive modeler in marketing. Now, what are predictive models? Why do marketers build predictive models? I'll just show you. They've got this problem. They want to work out which customers they want to contact. Because really, we're pretty simple. We just want to sell you more stuff. More stuff, in our case, is banking stuff. So it's home loans, personal loans, credit cards of a dozen different complexions and quasi exorbitant um, <coughs> interest rates. Um, <laughs> so we've got, we've got this problem. We want to work out who's the most likely, so, I mean, who's the most likely person to, to accept our marketing. Now, the context, I'll skip a little bit here. Um, I'm involved in what's called below the line marketing. So that means it's targeting individual, usually individual existing customers. Now, um, below the line marketing requires a, what's called the customer relationship management system. And at the bank, we've got one called national leads, not surprisingly. And um, another way of looking at this problem is just consider that in what I'm going to say, because that sort of gives a bit of context. Now, so far it all seems fairly simple, but unfortunately it isn't. Why is it so complicated? Why does the simple desire just to sell more stuff to more people produce a diagram like that? Well, the simple, <laughs> the not so simple uh, explanation is we try and push out a million leads a month um, to the right customers out of four and a half million active customers across many products and many, many channels. That's direct mail, um, call centre, bankers, ATMs, where you name it, the right message at the right time, track the results as well, and then subject to constraints like recency, privacy, we do think about that sometimes, and exclusions. And so um, the process is, what's notable about the process is it makes a very strict discipline of any of our modelling. It's got to be implemental. We can't model something which we can't rapidly put into production. Now my bit is actually the, the red bit there, and it's described in this diagram. Now, I won't go through it in any detail, just to say that the most important bit is the beginning. This is the campaign specification document which explains to us what the client, which is normally production, um, the campaign manager, really wants. They may not do it terribly well, which means there's a lot of rework, but we won't go into that. Um, then the next bit is getting the right responders and non-responders from our databases so that we can then go ahead and train and test the model. Uh, and that's where we spend most of our time trying to work out who's the most appropriate people 
to use for training and testing. This next bit's pretty easy, just getting the data. Next bit's even easier, which is fitting the model, because there's a lot of good software out there, and it can be highly automated, and so even though this is the most interesting part of my talk, I'll skip it. <laughs> um, the next bit is scoring the data, um, and you have to score the data, and then we push it back out to our national lead system, where the data or the scores are used to pick those people most likely to respond to our um, marketing. And then there's a bit I haven't shown here. We monitor the scores and the model performance. And if any models appear to deteriorate, we go back to the beginning, so we close the loop. Now, what's most interesting in the last 30 seconds is our challenges. And the biggest one is communicating and educating our stakeholders, which is a euphemism for trying to maintain and keep senior executive um, understanding and support. You may think, we've been doing this for 15 years, but um, we, um, we still, have to still have to justify our existence every time there's a restructure. So that's probably the biggest thing. Don't believe, always watch your back. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we're going to move on to Vasily. Uh, yeah, so I'm at Monash and at the CSIRO where I uh, simulate and data mine large turbulence data sets in the fields of engineering and geophysics. Uh, in my spare time, I'm also a big data analyst advisor for a startup company in uh, San Francisco in eHealth. Okay, so I think one thing that's kind of different to the data that I deal with as opposed to the data that most of you possibly deal with is that um, it's, it's very structured and it's very time consuming and expensive to generate the data, which I'm sure is also some of the data you guys deal with as well. But it essentially comprises of three basic steps. First of all, we define the ge geometry of the simulation of the flow of physics that we're interested in. So in this case, a very simple example, we've got a box between uh, a top wall and a bottom wall, and we're interested in the flow going from left to right. You might think it's simple, but it's freaking complicated. So the next step is then to chop that geometry down into tiny individual volumes, so that's what you see in the, in the middle here. So the more complex the flow is, the, the smaller the, the individual volumes are that you need to decompose them into. And then you solve a set of partial differential equations which govern how the flow evolves in time and space on a massive supercomputer, and you get what you see on the end here. So this is what turbulence looks like. So most of us, the only uh, real uh, interaction with the turbulence on a daily level is when the, when the pilot says, oh, ladies and gentlemen, fast your seatbelts, we're going to enter a into some turbulence. That's what we're entering into. So it's after this point that the data science actually begins. So in our field, we typically do use most of the same tools that you guys do. So um, first of all, three-dimensional visualization and animation to get a, a physical feeling of what it is that we're actually looking at. Uh, then we undertake principal component analysis or singular valley decomposition, POD, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same thing. And statistical analysis, uh, clustering methods, signal, signal processing, so Fourier transforms, wave, it's the whole, the whole shebang to uh, answer whatever questions that we're interested in a specific flow configuration that we're looking at. So I know we've gone through a lot of maths today, so I'm just going to show a bunch of pictures. So this is the, the kind of journey that I've been on over the last decade or so. So I did some work at DCO looking at um, missile shock formation, turbine combustion inside rockets, um, air in engine intake modelling, uh, oil slump sloshing uh, from my time at Holden. So this is when you're cornering, if you corner too fast, then the oil can start from the engine and things go bad. So got to make sure you understand that. And then my PhD flow over aircraft wings or wind turbines. Um, and more recently, atmospheric dynamics and oceanography at CSIRO. And the work that I'm kind of concentrating on now, uh, turbulent channel flow, that was at Monash. But the, the work that I'm going to focus on um, today is this latest simulation that we're working on. So this is pretty much the biggest simulation of its kind that's been attempted in the world. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a parallel, it's written in Fortran, it's a parallelized code using MPI and OpenMP, if that means anything to anybody. 
Um, it's been paralyzed up to 32,000 calls. Um, we're using the Magnus cluster in Perth, for those of you that are familiar with it. So uh, we're using up to 40 million CPU hours to run this particular case. And we're also using a second cluster in Germany because 40 million is not enough. Right? Uh, so the final grid has um, over 25 billion grid points. So because we have three velocity components and pressure at each point, we actually have 100 billion degrees of freedom. Uh, and each individual instant in time uh, is about 0.4 per terabyte. So the next instant in time is another 0.4 per terabyte. So you get the feeling, have a couple thousand of these up to a petabyte. So, and that's typically not a lot of data to answer the questions that we're trying to answer in this field of research. So what you'll see here is a snapshot of, um, on the right hand side, it's a composite of two different simulations actually. On the right hand side, it's flow over a flat surface. And on the left hand side, it's flow over a curved surface. It, it's actually flat, but we're kind of tricking the physics to think that it's on a curved surface. So I have a, um, a video, if it's here somewhere. Movies, maybe? <laughs> So for those of you that get motion sick, perhaps this is the best thing to look at. Um, so here we're starting, the flow is going into the screen. So on the right hand side, this is the flat surface um, side. So if you recall, we start off with a big three dimensional volume and we, at every individual point inside that volume, we have a value of velocity and pressure. But it's very hard to visualize the entire volume. So what we do, we search for um, a, an isosurface so it's kind of like when you see the, the weather prediction and you see lines of pressure. So that's an ISO line. So here, we're going from a three-dimensional volume to a bunch of two different two-dimensional surfaces. So I'll just hit play again. Okay. So anyway, so we're strafing through the flow. And you'll notice toward the end of the, um, the simulation domain, the turbulence is further away from the wall. And this is typically what you expect over curved surfaces. So. And there's plenty of questions we can answer um, with these kind of data sets, how uh, to more effectively um, you know, use fuel more efficiently on aircraft or transport oil more efficiently through pipes and stuff like that. But come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Vasily. Uh, we have one final speaker to end this session. And uh, like the last session, we're going to end with a little bit of more lighthearted topic. Uh, we're going to have Nick Apollyon come and talk to us. Uh, some, tell us something about Christmas. tonight for a really good cause um, for the Melbourne Analytics Charity Christmas Gala. I noticed you all remembered your Santa hats, just like me. <laughs> so a bit of an overview on what I'll be speaking to you about today. Uh, I'll say a little bit about what I do other than dress up in uh, Santa hats and um, talk about what a Christmas smells and sounds. Uh, introduction to an interesting paper from about 10 years ago um, and talk about their research method, uh, the results, discussions and conclusion um, and is this research relevant today as well as what about the next 10 years. By the way, I got a double session so you're in for 10 minutes. <laughs> So I've been a statistician for the last five years at the Royal Australian College of GPs. I'm also a PhD student, which I've been doing that for the last year. And um, at RMIT, so I work with the Industry Doctoral Training Centre and uh, work with my industry to do a project on item response theory and how we can better assess GPs before they enter general practice and the workforce. 
Um, also, young statistician representative, so anyone who's interested in the Statistical Society, come talk to me, any one of my colleagues. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Um, finally, I like Christmas, uh, among other things. And I'd like everybody to think about for a few minutes, or wait, one minute, um, what some Christmas smells and sounds might be. Uh, the other day I put up my Christmas tree and I uh, went to the shed and I smelled very dusty <coughs> afterwards. Um, but I don't think that's what we're talking about today. What about kids crying? That's always fun. Um, whether it's crying on Santa's lap or crying to get a new toy, uh, any one of those. Um, but I will ask the audience, and there are prizes, can anyone give me some traditional Christmas smells and sounds? Gingerbread. Yes. Who said that? Credo. <laughs> Alright. Anybody else? Oh, everybody's hands went up. Up the back. Sorry? Christmas trees. Christmas trees, yes. Anyone else? Come get your prize. <laughs> Alright, do not throw chocolate. Anyways. Um, what about Christmas sounds? Uh, sorry, um, Christmas sounds. Bells. Bells. Anyone? Anyone? Um, carols. Carols. Hey, anyone uh, going to be brave enough to sing us ten seconds worth of a carol? No. Yes. No. Okay. Christmas where the gum trees grow. There is no frost and there is no snow. Okay, nobody probably knows that one. But anyway, um, back to some serious business. There is uh, uh, this Journal of Business Research, um, and they had a paper in there, some research done in uh, about 10 years ago. And um, they did a two by two factorial design no scent versus Christmas scent, and non Christmas music versus Christmas music. They used 140 undergrad students uh, with a mean age of 21.4 years and about half were female. So this study, study was done in the US and I'll be talking about the paper which I have nothing to do with except for talking about it today. So they did a pretest. Um, they used 23 undergrads to evaluate nine cents that are apparently Christmassy. Um, I couldn't find the winner. The winner was Enchanted Christmas. I have no idea what that smells like. Could be fairies or maybe it's um, unicorns. Um, but I did find the apple spice and cinnamon kind of scent, um, which I did use as well. It was really funny the way they selected the music. Um, any Amy Grant uh, fans in the house? Nobody wants to admit to it. I'm sure you enjoyed some of her stuff. But for non-Christmas music, they used one of her early pop albums. And for Christmas music, they used her Christmas album. I don't know why, but that's what they did. So, in groups of 5 to 20 participants uh, were sent to a lab, shown 80 slides of merchandise, and then afterwards asked, questions in the survey. Um, basically they completed the questionnaire and uh, they took different kinds of measurements and did a manoeuvre at the end. They used this pad measure and environment which is pretty cool, pleasure, arousal and dominance. Um, they rated unhappy to happy, satisfied and satisfied. Look this is real stuff, it's all in the journal. <laughs> Here's some selected results and discussion. Um, interestingly, store attitudes are with their means and standard deviations here. When you used non-Christmas music and Christmas scent, the average wasn't as good as when you use two things that are related to each other. For example, they did well on 
non-Christmas music, no Christmas scent, and they did really well in Christmas music and Christmas scent. But still, in conclusion, although the authors like to go off and, and talk about the limitations and things like that and encourage people to, to get scents that match the season, um, no Christmas music and no scents still win. <laughs> Lucky for me. Um, so Christmas 2014. It turns out a couple of months ago I went to Sydney to a conference and I saw um, a lot of shops there on one of the main strips for sale, for lease. Not a lot of people go shopping anymore, or do they? Uh, there's a lot of online shopping, online dining, a lot of rewards and point systems. There's a lot of uh, feedback and customer experience if you find and people will give you free stuff for their feedback. That's got no correlation to what I did before. Um, but the next 10 years, Christmas 2024, let's think about what that might look like. Uh, today in uh, Melbourne Central, I saw a perfume billboard, a really big billboard with two different perfumes and you could test them right there and then and then you can rate which one is better. That was pretty cool, I never saw that before. There's things that are being developed in Smell TV and internet. We already know about the customizations of programs and will websites follow, and I'm not just talking about ads that you see on your social media and other sites. But if I went to a retail chain and it said, Monica Bullion, you are here, you are a female of this age and you like these products, so this website is all just for your pleasure and shopping experience. There's also customization of concerts. So the point is that the retail world is progressing. So are statisticians, analysts, data scientists, whatever you choose to call us. But I think, bring on the exciting future, think about what's happening, and on that note, big thanks to everybody again. Uh, big Merry Christmas to you all. I hope you had a lot of fun tonight. And if you have any questions, come see me later. Thanks. <laughs>
Um, we heard about arousal as in uh, us. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thanks to all our presenters um, for um, spending five minutes um, standing up here and telling us your thoughts. Um, <coughs> So, um, uh, before we finish off, um, uh, we are coming back next year. Um, so we've already got a couple of um, meetups uh, arranged for Mar March. Um, so there'll be some more information on the website, but um, uh, briefly, I think we mentioned last time already, uh, we've got a uh, Women in Data Science uh, event, which is a breakfast event. Detail soon, and we've got another one. More details. More details to come. Yeah, more details to come. <laughs> um, so it looks like they will be in March. So have a good rest and um, make sure you're ready to go for those. Um, and before um, I finally sign off, just a few things. So thanks again to all our sponsors. Um, yeah, we couldn't have done any of this um, without them. Uh, thank you very much. And I want to thank some people. So um, thanks to Damien for um, doing a lot of the work for, for this one. And um, he, he stepped in uh, a few months ago and helped us uh, run, run the show. So thank you. Um, a big thank you. There's someone behind the scenes who's uh, standing over there, Ross. Um, wave your hands around. Um, so Ross um, takes the videos. Um, in our meetups and then uh, make sure that they're available for everyone to see. So if you haven't noticed, there's a, a YouTube channel for Data Science Melbourne and uh, <coughs> it's pretty tedious. Ross uploads the videos on there and edits them a bit and makes sure they're all uh, fine for our viewing. Uh, so thank you very much, Ross. Much appreciated. Um, <coughs> now, um, final big, big thanks uh, to Phil. Um, so Phil does most of the work for, for this meetup. So, you might have heard him say a few times, you know, I want to kind of take you back to how it all started in around April, May. So um, you would have seen from some of his slides that uh, so I, I, I called him up and I had the idea to start the meetup. Um, essentially, um, it started like this. Um, as you know, I run the R user group, and um, <clears throat> it, it kind of came to me that um, uh, we needed something else. Uh, so I was kind of um, realized that there's all, all this stuff that you know, I want to be able to have presented as um, not just about R, um, that's, you know, or not just about Python or, or SAS. Um, and um, it's not necessarily just about um, predictive, uh, predictive modeling or, or machine learning. It could be about visualization, optimization. Um, didn't want it to be particularly about anything in specific, but somewhere we can talk about anything. Um, so the idea was, um, uh, the, and, and the one good thing about our user group was that it's a user group. So the format of a user group I wanted to maintain. Um, in other words, a forum for people to come and just feel comfortable to ask questions and just talk about, um, you know, not necessarily about something particularly innovative, um, but just hear about how do I get my job done? How do I, what do I do day to day to get, get stuff done? Just little things. Be able to have someone just talk about that and be able to network and ask people for tips and ideas and be comfortable doing that in a kind of casual environment. So we took the, the idea to take the user group and turn it into a, a data science kind of meetup. Um, so I, I found Phil and I said, hey, what do you think? Um, um, I want to I wanna have this data science meetup, um, but I want you to run it. Um, <laughs> and uh, he goes, but what is data science? And I was like, well, I don't know. You know let's, let's find out. Um, so, um, Eight months, seven, eight months later, um, I think I think we're starting to get an idea. Um, I really kind of um, mirror what Rob was saying that to me, what my thoughts now of what data science is is um, a kind of a collection of activities, a and therefore a collection of skills. Uh, I don't have to necessarily have all of them. Um, it's more about as um, you know, um, a, a group or you know, a platform. Say, you know, Kaggle is a good example where a group of people get together. And solve the problem, or um, or in a company you have a team of people with you know, with a, you know set of, a diverse set of skills that, that collectively can be thought of as data science, or this meetup where we all come from different backgrounds and different levels of experience um, to talk about stuff, which I think is why uh, this has been so popular. Um, um, 
But hang on, I was, I was thinking Phil was nice. So, um, <laughs> Phil does a tremendous amount of work every time to make this happen. Um, from, um, you know, talking to potential presenters, to sponsors, the venue, even getting the beers. Yeah, he, you know, he buys the beers and um, he carries them upstairs and um, when the lift's not working. Um, and pays the pizza guys and um, puts those funny slides at the beginning. Um, so, I really just want to finish up by a big, big, massive thanks to Phil. ask if anyone wants to stand up and tell about the job that they've got, or a few jobs that they've got going. Um, so I think there's a couple of people here tonight. So over here. <coughs> Hello everyone. Uh, my name's Gareth. I work for a law firm called Slade & Gordon. I'm a data scientist there. Um, and over the last few years, um, the firm has grown really rapidly and we're producing um, data at a really rapid uh, rate. Um, so much so that um, we've identified a new role for a process analyst. Um, so it's kind of a business facing role and we're looking for someone with um, strong SQL server skills, um, reporting skills, and but also with an analytical skill set. So you'll be working predominantly in the analytics team, myself and William over there, um, and it's our, our job to make sense of the data. So if you're interested, um, Come chat to us, and then um, yeah, we'll tell you a bit more about the role. Thanks. Most of the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So all, all jobs also are uh, encouraged yeah. to post on the discussion forum. So that one will be on there. I think we had someone else expressed an interest in talking. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Andreas. Uh, I work for Vida, and we're looking for a couple of graduates um, with strong numerical skills, I think it's a standard thing people say. So um, we've got people who come from engineering, um, psychology, um, physics. I myself um, come from a pure maths background. Um, so we're looking for a couple of people who will be involved in building credit risk models that will basically judge how risky you are uh, with respect to not paying any of your loans ever. And you have to do that for all of Australia. So it's um, great fun. And if you interest in that kind of, kind of thing, come talk to me afterwards. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, well, I'm always looking for people, so I work at iSelect. Um, come and speak to me if you're interested. We're always looking to get more people. Um, if there's no one else, uh, I think that's all we have for today. Um, so thanks again to all our speakers for a really fascinating mix of talks. Um, there might still be some wine left and some, we put some more beer in the fridge so it should be cold by now. There might be some cheese left. Um, how long do we have? Um, another, another half an hour or so, so please do stick around. Um, and then other than that, uh, have a great break, have a good holiday, and we'll see you again uh, early next year.